Hi, this is Elliot Fishman, and welcome to part two of our talk on advanced cinematic rendering. And I left off last time uh, mentioning that small bowel tumors can have great impact when you look at cinematic rendering in terms of detection and lesion characterization. Also, the ability to look at the vascular map can help determine resectability. And again, this concept of preoperative planning for the surgeon. Also, I believe cinematic rendering can play a major role in radiation therapy planning. Let's look at some examples. You can see very nicely on this case, on the axial images, there's an enhancing lesion in the duodenum, one centimeter, there it is on the coronal, very nicely shown in the duodenum on the cinematic rendering. And again, you can see how I've changed the rendering parameters to really accentuate the visualization. Just a very nice example of a GIST tumor. Again, you could have thought of carcinoid as well. That would have been a good differential diagnosis. Here's another GIST tumor, but it's exophytic coming off the duodenum right here and here in the coronals. And then very nicely shown the textural changes, the relationship to the duodenum, really nicely shown on the 3D mapping. And again, these bottom two images, I really give you a feel about how we can look at necrosis and how the texture map can change depending on the parameters you use. Another gist tumor. First look at the patient's skin. You can see these nodules. This patient has neurofibromatosis. And the patient has multiple gist tumors in the small bowel, which are not uncommon in patients with neurofibromatosis. You can see very nicely here, this is the skin. One of the nice things with cinematic rendering, really nice visualization of the skin. And then, of course, the multiple neurofibromas seen in the patient's abdomen involving the small bowel. Now, an area we've also written about, and I think is probably underutilized, is musculoskeletal trauma. It surely is optimizing fracture detection and in complex injuries looking for vascular injury as well as muscle injury as well as soft tissue injury it really gives you a total visualization of a patient's trauma which again how do we use it we use it for planning whether it's for surgery or for non-surgical intervention and here's a patient with a right internal iliac artery aneurysm or pseudoaneurysm as a sequel of prior trauma you can see it nicely on the patient's axial imaging. You also see some changes in the attenuation of the muscle. And now you can see what I did in this case is I simply went through the same data set with different renderings, which show you the muscle or accentuate the vasculature. I rotate the images to bring the best visualization into perspective. And again, you can think about it. I'm showing you snapshots. All of this is interactive rendering, so if you're doing it on a computer, you can see everything in real time. Another example, you can see from the axials this patient has a laceration, the patient had trauma, but look at the detail of the laceration of the skin and the muscle, very nicely shown in the cinematic rendering. And then when I adjust the parameters, I can show you there's no vascular injury, the popliteal artery and trifurcation vessels are all very well seen. Another patient, this patient had trauma. This opaque density is a piece of glass. You can see it in the gluteal muscle. You also see the act of bleeding. There it is when I show you the muscle on the cinematic rendering. And then look at the patient's uh, vascular map. We can see the multiple fragments of glass and the patient's act of bleeding. All very nicely shown, all giving you a global perspective of what's going on. Another patient, pseudoaneurysm post-trauma, and you can see very nicely here, right? Look at the patient's uh, pseudoaneurysm. You see the vessels here. And again, looking at it from a classic volume rendering into a classic cinematic rendering perspective. Now, in the future, I really believe that there will be more integration of information. One of the things that AI demands is more information. Saying the patient has a liver mass that's 5 cm is great, but I believe all of these things can be built into volume rendering. So if you look at this case, and this is a case I showed you before of a large hepatoma showing you the axials, the MIP, and the cinematic from arterial and venous phase. But then the computer could draw the boundaries of the liver, can draw the boundaries of the tumor, and then calculate both liver and tumor volumes so you have the information here. So here you have all the information you need to do 
You can see the liver volume and the tumor volume. Often this becomes very important in terms of planning surgery, and it goes across many different applications. Now, when you think about it, uh, as I mentioned, almost everything I've shown you here, except for one video, are screenshots. But again, the ideal thing will be video loops where the physician can go in and interactively change the parameters and change the position. So let's look at some examples. Here's a patient with a mass. For a second, you might think of a gist tumor because it goes intraluminal, well-defined, but it's water density. This is a duplication cyst of the stomach. The static images are very nice, showing you beautifully the detailed folds of the stomach and the cinematic rendering of the patient's duplication cyst. But now let's go a bit further. Now when I look at this thing as a volume and I look at it interactively, I can really get a feel of how the lesion projects into the stomach from the gastric wall. I get a really good look at the patient's gastric folds. And then I could simply rotate the images to any plane or perspective I want. It's much easier if you're the referring clinician, you have a much better 3D understanding if you can look at everything interactively. And here's just another view of that same rendering where I'm giving you a few different perspectives. Now you could change the lighting model as well if you wanted to. You could remove the ribs. You can pull the stomach out. You can do whatever you want. And again, I think a big part of imaging going forward is going to be the fact that these tools will be in the hands of our referring physicians. I think it's important for radiology to be the master of their own domain. If not, the referring clinicians will be. Another example, a patient with pancreatic cancer. Patient has a small tumor. You nicely see the small gland in terms of lobulations. You see the textural change here. You see the patient's uh, splenic vein and portal vein. But again, now let's look at this interactively. So the ability to look at the uh, vessels, the ability to just simply look closer at the patient's tumor, and then really target the transition. You can see the texture mapping here really allows you to pick up a one centimeter lesion. Look how much more obvious it is as I change the parameters. So one of the key things for us is the ability to change the parameters of this data set. And you can see that just very nicely as you look at the images. And again here, the same basic principle as I go to the second set of images. Again, if you're the surgeon or the radiologist, the ability to look interactively. Here I'm looking at the interaction between the stomach and the mass. I'm looking at the relationship to the portal vein. I'm looking at the relationship to the splenic vein. And again, I could choose any different parameter, I could change the renderings to really define whether it's soft tissue, as in different organs, or it's the vessel. Whatever you want to see, you'll be able to. Another example, this is a patient with a neuroendocrine tumor in the tail of the pancreas. You see the lesion right here, right? Because you can see how it changes the texture of the tumor compared to the texture of the gland. That's a one centimeter lesion beautifully seen. And as I render it and I look at the images, I can show nicely the relationship of the mass to the splenic artery, which is intact. You can see it toward the left renal vein, which is intact. I can look at the small feeding vessels going into that neuroendocrine tumor very nicely there. And I could do the same thing on the second image. Again, looking at the different techniques, you can see side by side how I could really optimize visualization. And when I speak about detection of small tumors, it's this idea of looking at changes in texture. When you have a big mass, whether this textural changes or not, you're going to see the mass. But the things people miss are the smaller lesions, be they neuroendocrine tumors or be they adenocarcinoma. But again, the ability to change the rendering parameters to show everything interactively becomes very, very critical and is something I think is the way that this process needs to be done. So again, simply looking at the range of images that we're able to create becomes very important. And here it is again. So in terms of what I am doing now, I am doing many of these video loops and then I'll send the video loop, I hate to say via email, uh, the identified to the patient's referring clinician because we can't store videos on our PAC system, which is kind of annoying. Most PAC systems are like that. So I think PAC systems really need to be better at storing 
these video loops. Imagine when you're looking at this at surgery, when the surgeon goes into surgery, they pop this up, they look at it, they remember exactly what they thought about in the case. Another example, it's not just pancreas. Look at the patient's stenosis of the left subclavian artery. And you could see I've optimized the visualization to show the vessels. It's kind of a very nice shadowy opacity of the patient's vessels, looking at the outside of the vessel. But you can see I'm optimizing the flow in the vessel. I show you the relationship of the subclavian to the aorta. You can imagine using this for many different processes, right? You can imagine if we looked at this in a patient who had subclavian steel, potentially, or just looking at vessels in general, really being able to quantify the degree of stenosis that indeed may be present. And again, think of the image on the right. It's a great image, but doing this interactively is so much more powerful. And here again, I'm now going to change that image on the right, make that a interactive display. And again, I'm simply rotating the images as I'm thinking about what I would need to do, whether I'm going to do surgery or put a stent in, looking at the origin of the vessel, looking at the degree of stenosis. And again, quantification can be done from these images. Another patient, this patient has mesenteric vascular grafts. Now, it's hard to really appreciate the graphs and the extent and orientation when you look at axial images. But now I'm doing the 3D interactively, and you can see that graph that was put on the patient's aorta that goes to the patient's right renal artery and the patient's left renal artery. And again, the visualization and the ability to really interact rather than looking at individual slices. You can do multiplanar reconstructions, but obviously the anatomy is so complex the vascular uh, reconstruction is so complicated that it's only in 3D that you really could appreciate it, and it's really only in these images where you really understand the process to the level you would want to. And here's just, again, rotating both sets of images. I don't think I need to tell you how valuable this is to our vascular surgeons. We have some amazing surgeons, Jim Black, for example. Just look at this surgery. It's like beauty. Uh, putting a graft on the aorta, then up to the renal arteries, maintaining great flow. But you need to manage these patients and follow these patients, and this is just an excellent way of doing it. Other examples. Here's a patient with abdominal pain who ends up with a small bowel intersusception. Now I've changed the parameters to look at the small bowel. I can see the dilated small bowel, and then I could follow and detect the intersusception in the patient's left upper quadrant in jejunum. Again, look at the detail of the folds. I also can give you a really good look at the patient's vascular map. And again, we can do this across a series of images, which you very nicely see in this case. So again, the ability to interact. Now, both images in motion, you see the intersusception, sort of that, uh, that uh, crescent centrally. Uh, this was a patient with a small bowel tumor. Now, you can see very nicely the extent of involvement. Again, looking at small bowel obstruction, looking at for small bowel tumors, this potentially is an excellent way of doing things. Now, looking forward, just like you're looking at this on a computer, it's a flat screen. The 3D works well, but if you really want to do 3D, you need augmented reality or virtual reality. And the key technique is HoloLens from Microsoft. It provides a field, large, wide field of view, which is typically associated with the volume, with the um, virtual reality devices. Microsoft states that mixed reality is empowering providers, payers, and health science experts to reimagine healthcare. And I think if you do it correctly, that indeed is the case. The new HoloLens 2 is great. The first one I had, I'd take my glasses off because it would squish your face by your glasses. It was kind of very tight fitting. This new one kind of sits in front of you so you can almost flip it up so I can wear my glasses, which means I can see what's going on. Some initial work by Robert Schneider and his team from Siemens at RSNA 2019 showed that cinematic rendering could be combined with a virtual reality for enhanced visualization, and we are beginning to look at this. Uh, there's been other things published in the literature and the topic but I think it's an opportunity for radiology. It's just really an excellent opportunity to be involved in this cutting edge technology. 
Here's an article from the surgical literature. Mixed reality visualization during surgical planning may facilitate accurate and rapid identification of small lung lesions during minimally invasive surgeries and reduce the need for additional invasive preoperative localization procedures. So that indeed sounds very, very promising. Or this article in liver surgery, the initial experience suggested that an intraoperative hologram with mixed reality techniques contributed to last minute simulation, not for navigation. The intraoperative hologram might be a new next generation operation supportive tool in terms of spatial awareness, sharing, and simplicity. Indeed, very impressive. Or in this article on congenital heart disease, this preliminary study demonstrates that MR holograms as surgical planning tools for congenital heart disease may have a high diagnostic value and contribute to understanding complex morphology. And finally, augmented reality for uh, lumbar facet joint injections. Augmented reality guided facet joint injections are feasible and accurate without potentially harmful needle placement in an experimental setting. So it's not ready for prime time yet, but boy, it's coming along fast. Going back to cinematic rendering, and I spoke about texture mapping, this may be ideal for detecting the presence of tumor where the texture differs, but the mass may not be defined. Early pancreatic cancer is a good example. We can analyze the texture for specific tumor types with radiomics to predict tumor types and predict potentially outcomes or predict response to chemotherapy. And we can analyze specific tumors to help predict optimal treatment and outcome. And again, here's just a nice example. Here's a spent tumor, cystic component. Just to show you, yes, you can see it on the axial views and the coronals, but look how much more obvious it is. You also appreciate the cystic components better, which allowed us to make the diagnosis of a spent tumor, which is somewhat unusual, more common in younger females. But again, here's a good example of four different renderings really accentuating the patient's tumor. Here's another patient with B-cell lymphoma involving the pancreas and adrenal glands, but the tumor infiltration is best seen on the cinematic rendering. Yes, on the axials, you see the masses in the adrenal, you see the pancreas, but look at the textural changes when you look at cinematic rendering. So again, how much this is gonna help us, I don't know, but I think it will be very, very valuable. And here's just some more images showing you the adrenal involvement as well as the pancreatic involvement. And how well we can stabilize things in terms of being able to stabilize or have a standard imaging technique acquisition and then display is really gonna see how well we can drive this technology. Another example, an infiltrating tumor in the liver, a hepatoma with spontaneous bleed. The infiltration of the tumor is particularly well seen in the cinematic rendering. Obviously, it's not a subtle tumor and the axials and coronals and the volume rendering show it well, but you have a better feel of the infiltration on the cinematic rendering. And here's a full set of views of the process. Also very nicely showing you the extension into the hepatic veins and portal vein and the patient's IVC. And finally, this case of a patient looking at textural changes uh, of a pancreatic lesion the textual changes show the vascularity of the lesion, show its appearance sharply marginated, it looks like a baseball almost, one centimeter or so. This was a neuroendocrine tumor. So the texture mapping of neuroendocrine tumors looks different than adenocarcinoma, seems to look different than spent tumors, and surely looks different than serous adenomas and MCNs. Now can we distinguish spends and MCNs from serous adenoma? We'll have to take a look at that. But again, from a surgical perspective, also the vascular mapping, and you can see how the tumor matches the enhancement of the arterial structures, splenic artery, celiac, and SMA, as well as the differentiation between the tumor and the patient's pancreatic gland. Here's a patient with an adenocarcinoma in the head of the pancreas. You see the mass, I think it's well-defined. You're not gonna miss that mass, hopefully. You can see it's pushing on the portal vein, SMV confluence. But again, the textural change is better seen. I show you this case also to show the difference of the textural map between adenocarcinoma and the prior case of a neuroendocrine tumor. 
again changing the rendering parameters to accentuate the textural map and again this may prove to be very important in terms of predicting response to chemotherapy as well as predicting outcome another example patient with adenocarcinoma of the pancreas with a dilated pancreatic duct and again texture mapping you see the dilated pancreatic duct particularly on the coronal views you see the transition and then look how nicely you can see the tumor on the cinematic the dilated duct but the tumor which was poorly visualized on the axials let me go backwards again you see the axial you kind of know where the tumor has to be but it's hard to see it may be right here this is where it has to be but it's better seen on the cinematic where you can accentuate the textural map now again this idea about cinematic with vascular mapping really nicely shown in this example now one of the things we also spoke about i mentioned small bowel previously but i want to go back and show you how texture mapping or tissue texture changes can be very valuable in detecting the presence of perfusion changes which then change the texture mapping of the bowel it may be valuable in cases of suspected ischemia or perhaps defining the activity of Crohn's disease and may enhance the role of CT enterography. Here's a nice example of obviously abnormal bowel, a misty mesentery. This is a patient with ischemic bowel with clot in the portal vein and SMV. But look at it when you look at the cinematic rendering. Look at the clot in the portal vein and SMV. But more importantly, look at the bowel pattern. You see the mucosa and submucosa, the enhancement of the mucosa, the low density and edema in the submucosa. This is a really good case of ischemia. So again, can we accentuate and can we grade ischemia? Can we do more planning by looking at these images? How much more information does these images have compared to the routine axial or coronal CT? That's something we are looking at. Look at the detail of what you can see. Again, looking nicely at the vessels, looking at the vessels and they're really small, and looking at the bowel wall. Again, just really nice visualizations. And you can see when you look at it interactively, just really the strength of what you can do. So I am very excited about the potential of where this can in fact go. So it does become very important to us to really look, not just to say we're making pretty pictures, but can we really change how things indeed get managed? That's something that we really are very excited about. So we hopefully will see that coming along as we look toward the future. Now, I also wanted to comment about texture in the stomach. Again, uh, normal versus uh, abnormal lesions in the stomach. Again, the stomach is often challenging if it's not well distended, may be very helpful in GI bleeding. And again, for tumors, Here's a nice example of a bleeding gastric ulcer. Uh, look at the antrum and the antral changes. You know, the stomach is thickened. There's the site of bleeding and there's some blood. But you really appreciate the mucosa and submucosa on the cinematic rendering. The texture mapping better shows you that the stomach is inflamed. Even though the stomach is not as well distended as we would like, the cinematic rendering is very helpful. And here's some more views showing you that. I particularly like these views from below, which really show you the changes. Here's normal stomach, normal stomach. But look at the antrum. You can see the inflammation and infiltration. Can I say this was tumor versus inflammation? I'm not positive, but it's something we'll be looking at. Now, in terms of cinematic rendering and data visualization, we wonder if further analysis of CT data with cinematic rendering can help with optimized lesion detection, but also um, can it be a value in really thinking about the use of imaging in terms of planning management? Um, again, the textual changes we think are the earliest signs of tumor, and we continue to investigate this possibility. The interesting question, of course, is combining the work we're doing with radiomics and AI and cinematic rendering. I think, you know, everything seems these days to be standing in its own silo. I think to really make things work well, you need to get away from the silo and combine things. And I think that will indeed be exciting. Similarly, the use of cinematic rendering may prove helpful in early detection of other organs. I mentioned the pancreas we've been looking at, but also looking at the spleen and liver and kidneys. 
Again, the key is how we can understand what the cinematic rendering is doing and how we can control the various parameters to get some certainty. Our surgeons, as I mentioned from the start, love cinematic rendering for surgical planning, whether it's in the GI or vascular musculoskeletal system. Again, the more complicated the case, the better it is for cinematic rendering. I'll also mention that cinematic rendering, we've been using it a little bit, other people have as well, for education. We have a wonderful app on the Apple Store that uses cinematic rendering for anatomy of the chest and heart. It's something worthwhile looking at because you can see from the cinematic rendering here, we use a combination of labeling and videos and interactivity to really allow you to see things. You can see, for example, here, I'm showing you and labeling the uh, muscles, and then we're going looking at the costochondral junctions, looking at the bony structures, then going to the vessels. So you can see you're able to interactively really teach anatomy. It's really almost doing, um, it's really almost going to an autopsy, right? You're able to go in and be able to show the various structures and go in there and look layer by layer. And you can see, for example, in this patient's heart, where we've labeled the coronary arteries, the individual chambers, we then use the transfer functions from the cinematic rendering to accentuate the coronary arteries. And this was a wonderful job done by Hanna Recht um, on, in terms of anatomy and uh, Hanna with um, being able to uh, look and have those labels follow. Just a wonderful way of teaching anatomy. I think that's very, very important. And it's for free. You can go to the Apple Store, CTSS Chest Atlas 3D CRT. Today's January 2nd. You can download it for free. So what to expect this coming year? We hate to guess, because if I guessed last year, I would not have guessed COVID. Uh, there's a good way of thinking about things. Bill Gates, we always underestimate the change that will occur in the next two years and underestimate the change that will occur in the next 10 Lao Tzu, going back 1,500 or 1,600 years, those who have knowledge don't predict, those who predict don't have knowledge, so I better not predict. And Don Rumsfeld, as we know, there are the known knowns, the things we know we know. We also know there are known unknowns, that is to say we know there are some things we don't know, but there are also unknown unknowns, the ones we don't know we don't know. To me, those unknown unknowns are really the exciting things. Now, for cinematic rendering to prosper, uh, we need to have clinical studies that measure outcomes with and without cinematic rendering. We need more clarity into the variability of image quality and its impact on clinical utility. We need clinical studies comparing radiologists' accuracy with or without cinematic rendering. And we need clinical studies using at the end user. Even if it doesn't change the radiologist's interpretation, if the end user changes their management, it becomes very, very important. I think AI is going to help us optimize visualizations. I think AI is going to help us use the texture mapping to detect lesions in the data set. I believe the visualizations will change from me looking at the screen to using HoloLens and more tools to optimize image quality, including lighting models, are going to come along. And here's a slide I showed you the other day, or this was from the other day, when I spoke a bit about the hollow lens. I think it's very exciting. So I'll let you know that's something we will push in 2021. And with that, I thank everybody for their attention and have a great day. If you liked what you heard here today, please make sure to hit that subscribe button and visit our website, ctss.com, for lectures, quizzes, pearls, and more. Also, be sure to check out our apps that are available for free on the Apple Store. All links are in the description box below.